Most Formula 1 champions, especially the ones who have won multiple times over, possess unique personalities that endear themselves to the fans. From the likes of Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen going from unruly youngsters with reckless attitudes to respected multiple-time title winners, to the calm and collected Kimi Raikkonen who couldn't care less about anything that wasn't driving. Arguably the most recognisable and famous character in the sport though is one whose success and notoriety on track is far more limited than those mentioned above, but is nonetheless loved today as an embodiment of a bygone era which gives a lot of people who grew up watching him a great sense of nostalgia when he is mentioned. He has undoubtedly the most distinctive personality in Formula 1 history and one that everyone who knows their stuff loves for his on and off track actions. Without further ado, let's indulge our thoughts and dive into the career of F1's coolest champion. James Simon Wallace Hunt was born on the 29th of August 1947 in Belmont, Surrey, to a well-connected and wealthy family. His father, Wallace, was a stockbroker and direct descendant of Sir William Jackson, a baronet and entrepreneur during the 1800s, and James first experienced automobiles when he learnt to drive a tractor on a family holiday in Wales, before passing his driving test one week after his 17th birthday, a big turning point in his life. He had dabbled in tennis during his formative years, and before he turned 18, Hunt accompanied his doubles partner's brother to an event at Silverstone, where he was racing minis. This experience sparked his love for motor racing and he bought his own Austin machine soon after and entered a race at Snetterton, but was prevented from competing by his scrutineers due to various infractions with his car. After he acquired funds to make necessary modifications to allow him to take part, the young Brit would drive three further events in his Mini before advancing to Formula Ford aged 20 in 1968. A good season saw the rookie debut at the aforementioned Snetterton, where he finished fifth despite losing 15 horsepower due to an incorrect ignition setting. He set the lap record at the club circuit in Brands Hatch, the precursor to the Indy layout, and took a victory at Lydon Hill too. 1969 saw him advance to British F3, where he showed great skill to be constantly in the mix, apparently winning several races, although I cannot find any verified results to clarify this. He became known for his aggressive style the year after, following an accident at Crystal Palace with future touring car driver Dave Morgan, as when the pair crashed into each other and retired, they had a fight and the latter was pushed onto the ground by Hunt. Morgan had his racing license suspended for 12 months, while going into 1971, James continued in F3, but the following year was far more notable as he got a third in Mallory Park, but Hunt the Shunt was excluded from the results due to engine infractions. Fourth and fifth followed in the next two rounds at Brands Hatch, then he retired due to a collision in Alton Park. The second event held at Mallory saw him battle with Roger Williamson, and he beat the fellow young Brit to a spot on the rostrum, then he missed the round at Zandvoort. From there on, Hunt was replaced at the March F3 outfit by Jochen Mass, although he raced in a privateer entry at Monaco, meaning he would need a new team to take him on. He found this when Lord Hesketh and Anthony Horsley, also known as Bubbles, created their own operation which aimed to bring glitz and glamour to the very oily and down-to-earth scene of motor racing. After competing in the lower formulas with Horsley, then Hunt in the latter half of 1972, they moved the team up to F1 for the following year, entering with a bang at the race of champions at Brands Hatch, where James finished third in a customer Surtees chassis. Hesketh made their Grand Prix debut at Monaco of all places, after a young Harvey Postlethwaite made minor adjustments to a March 731 purchased by the team. Hunt qualified 18th for his first start, but suffered from engine failure with 5 laps remaining while running 6th, eventually being classified in 9th as he had still completed 90% race distance. They missed the next round in Sweden, but at Paul Ricard for the French Grand Prix, James came home 6th, claiming the final point on offer, then went from strength to strength as he diced with the likes of Peter Revson, Denny Holm and Ronnie Peterson for the win at Silverstone, taking the fastest lap on his way to 4th place. At the next event in Zandvoort, a venue that would prove particularly prolific for Hunt, he qualified a so far career best 7th before driving to a first podium finish in 3rd, a minute adrift of Tyrrell's Jackie Stewart who won. The outfit missed the German Grand Prix held on the Nürburgring Nordschleife, and Hunt proceeded to get 9th on the grid for the race on the Österreich ring before injection issues halted his chances on lap 3. He totaled the chassis in practice at Monza, forcing him not to start, then was 7th at Mossport, although there may have been a potential scoring error during that race, due to it being the first instance where a safety car was deployed in Formula 1. The driver of a yellow Porsche 914, former privateer Epi Veit says, had picked up Howden Ganley as the leader, but the Kiwi wasn't in first, so the likes of Ronnie Peterson and co, who were legitimately in the first few positions, gained a whole lap on those behind. I'm not exactly sure if his predicament affected Hunt at all, but it may have done. 
He then qualified fifth for the season-ending United States Grand Prix at Watkins Glen before coming home in second place behind the aforementioned Peterson, also taking the fastest lap for the second time that season. Hunt finished eighth in the 1973 driver's standings, despite taking the start in less than half of the races, and the hair skiff operation moved into 1974 with the intention to make significant improvements to their single march chassis, although these changes wouldn't come until the third round. Nonetheless, Hunt qualified fifth in Buenos Aires, but suffered from overheating issues and retired on lap 11. A lonely ninth place at Interlagos followed, before the upgraded car came in for James in South Africa, where the improvements were so prominent that the machine was christened the Hesketh 308, no longer under the March banner despite it being an evolution of their design. Hunt had transmission failure in Kailami, before a disappointing 10th in Harama and suspension failure which led him to crashing out in Nivelle Ballers, then he had half-shaft issues in Monaco. The Swedish Grand Prix at Anderstorp saw him achieve his first points and maiden podium of the year, claiming third place behind Jody Schechter and Patrick Depayet, but the attrition continued as James failed to finish in any of the next four rounds at Zandvoort, Dijon Prenois, Brands Hatch and the Nürburgring Nordschleife. He returned to the rostrum at the Österreich Ring, taking another bronze medal behind Carlos Reutemann and Denny Holm, then engine failure at Monza came before a fourth at Mossport and third at Watkins Glen, where at the latter event James qualified a so far career-high second place, 17 thousandths away from pole. Despite the extreme attrition he faced during 1974, finishing only 4 out of 15 rounds in the points, Hunt still finished 8th in the standings, on a similar points tally to the year prior. The Hesketh outfit continued to bring upgrades to its sole chassis heading into the next season, as they appeared at the first race in 75, sporting a B-spec model of the 308, which James then finished second and got a fastest lap on debut with in Argentina, although it could have been a victory as he had led during the middle portion of the event, before cracking under pressure and ceding the lead to two-time champion Emerson Fittipaldi. He then got sick for Interlagos despite it being one of his weaker circuits, but retired from all of the next five races in South Africa, Spain, Monaco, Belgium and Sweden. At the Dutch Grand Prix held at the Zandvoort circuit, Hunt qualified third, then after the race started in wet conditions, it dried up and he switched to slick tyres before anyone else, a decision which paid dividends when he went past leader Nicky Lauda on lap 15. The Austrian chased him down for the remainder of the afternoon, but James held on to take his and Hesketh's first Grand Prix victory. This was an underdog triumph for the ages, as Hesketh were often seen as being unserious by the other teams because they often partied during and after weekends with expensive champagne and caviar, regardless of their results, and such scenes were completely unique in an era where most garages in the pit lane were extremely down to earth, covered in oil and grease, and definitely not maintaining an upper class wealthy appearance. James followed up his breakthrough win with a second place in Paul Ricard, then fourth in Silverstone, but he retired due to wheel trouble on the Nürburgring Nordschleife before taking another runners-up spot behind Vittorio Brambier in Austria as the Italian took the only triumph of his career. Hunt rounded off his season with fifth in Monza and fourth in Watkins Glen, putting him fourth in the Drivers' Championship, only behind Niki Lauda, Emerson Fittipaldi and Carlos Reutemann. Heading into 1976 though, James's position on the grid was in jeopardy, as Lord Hesketh had ran out of money and had to pull out of F1, meaning the team would be run instead by his right-hand man, Anthony Horsley, aka Bubbles, from earlier, on a shoestring budget. This left their star driver in a very awkward place, as there seemed to be no other top drives available for the new season. Luckily for the young Brit, McLaren's lead driver, the previously mentioned Fittipaldi, decided to commit career suicide by joining his brother's family-run Copa Sucar outfit, which operated at the other end of the field. The Woking team, who were themselves scrambling for options like Hunt was, signed him on a $50,000 contract, which had lucrative bonuses thanks to shares of the prize money being available. James was filling the shoes of a fantastic driver who had come runners-up in 1975 and won the championship for McLaren the year before that, but he kicked his campaign off with a bang by taking pole position at the Interlagos circuit where he'd previously struggled, although he lost the lead on lap 1 before retiring with a jammed throttle on lap 32. He started first again in Kyle Army, but the Ferrari of Nicky Lauda led from start to finish with James coming home hot on his heels 1.3 seconds behind in second at the chequered flag. Hunt qualified third for the inaugural F1 event held at the now iconic Long Beach Street Circuit, and after maintaining position on the start, he began bearing down on the Tyrrell of Patrick Depaye in front of him. As they approached the final hairpin on the track on lap 4, the Frenchman covered the inside, forcing James to go the long way round, but as the Brit came upon the corner exit, Depaye cut across him, putting Hunt out of the race, at which point, he waited for his rival to come back round before waving his fist at him as he drove by. Another small anecdote was that although the McLaren driver believed he had terminal damage, this wasn't the case as when his mechanics came back to recover the car, they could easily get it back to the pits. 
Lauda's second place put him well clear in the Drivers' Championship, but James rebounded at the Spanish Grand Prix by taking a pole position and despite losing the lead in the opening stages of the event, retook it on lap 32 and crossed the line first ahead of his Austrian rival. However, the winning machine was disqualified for being 1.5 cm too wide, handing Lauda the victory provisionally as McLaren went on to appeal the ruling. The Ferrari driver won again in Zolda, while Hunt retired with gearbox failure, and this result was repeated in Monaco when the Brit's engine died on lap 24. Nicky was crushing the field on 51 points, more than three times the total of his second place teammate in the standings, Clay Regazzoni, who had 15, while James sat on a paltry 6. Lauda scored a so far season low of third at the next event in Anderstorp, two places clear of Hunt in fifth, although the latter was still in seventh in the championship on a lowly 8 points. However, when the paddock rocked up to Paul Ricard in France, the Brits scored a pole and race victory, while the runaway title favourite Nicky suffered his first mechanical failure of the year, decreasing their gap to 38 points. Before the next event at Brands Hatch, Hunt's disqualification from the Spanish Grand Prix was rescinded, and he was credited with a triumph over Lauda, but more controversy over rules and regulations transpired over the incoming weekend. The Ferrari duo collided at Turn 1 on the opening lap, causing melee behind them, with James going into the air and Jacques Lafitte also getting involved. The race was red flagged immediately due to the debris on the circuit, and as was commonplace for a long time in F1, all the teams caught up in the crash started preparing their spare chassis for use on the restart. Despite this, the stewards said that they would not be permitted to use their third cars, and anyone who hadn't completed their in-lap under their own steam would not be allowed to take further part. While the McLaren higher-ups were busy bickering with the governing body, their mechanics managed to repair Hunt's car so it could be used, and when the partisan crowd began chanting, we want Hunt, and throwing litter onto the track in protest that their driver was being stopped from racing, the organisers relented and allowed him to take the restart. He soon found himself in second place, chasing louder, but gearbox problems for the leading man allowed the home hero to surge through, with the fans cheering as he came out of the forest section in the lead. He duly crossed the finish line first, but the Scuderia, Tyrrell and Coppa Fittipaldi filed a protest against the result, believing that since Hunt hadn't completed a full in-lap on his way back to the pits under red flag conditions, instead of bypassing most of the track via the short loop, that he hadn't adhered to the rules. The result stood initially, but Ferrari lodged an appeal with the RAC in the UK, which was rejected. Then they went to the FIA, who scheduled a hearing for the 25th of September. Just like in Spain, the original decision stood for now, and James closed the gap to Lauda to 23 points before the next race at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer. Due to the circuit's extreme length and growing unsuitability for the cars at the time, it had already been decided that 1976 would be the last year that the gargantuan green hell was used for Grand Prix racing. Hunt took pole with his title adversary second, but the Austrian called to boycott the event, like the F1 grid at Spa in 1969, and this same venue a year later. A vote was held between the drivers, and it was tipped in the favour of holding the event despite a forecast of rain. The race started in wet conditions, and most chose groove tyres, although this proved to be the wrong choice, as Jochen Mass, familiar with the climate of the region, opted for slicks and was leading partway through the second lap after the majority of the field followed his strategy call at the end of the first. Lauda was pushing to make up for lost time, but he crashed at Bergwerk, at which point his car set on fire and his helmet was torn off, as several others joined the carnage. Four drivers, namely Guy Edwards, Brett Lunger, Harold Ertel, and Arturo Mezzario, rushed to his aid, getting him out after 55 seconds in the blaze. Nicky was hospitalised for the time being, and his rival Hunt won the restarted race, but celebrations were mooted given the circumstances, although James had provisionally closed to 14 points behind Lauda, pending the decision regarding Brands Hatch. With the championship leader out of action for the near future, Hunt needed to capitalise on a golden opportunity to make up considerable ground. He started on pole at the Österreich ring while Ferrari didn't even turn up to race, protesting the decision to formally reinstate the first dubious victory of the season from James in Spain. The Brits finished fourth from the front of the grid, then won the Dutch Grand Prix at a venue he always went well at in Zandvoort, putting him within two points of Lauda heading into Monza. Battered, bruised and bandaged up from his burns, Nicky made a miraculous recovery at the Temple of Speed, taking fourth place while Hunt and his teammate Jochen Mass were dropped to the rear of the field in qualifying due to alleged fuel irregularities, before both retired early on, with ignition trouble for the German and James spinning off trying to charge back through the pack. This put Lauda five points ahead going into the final three rounds of the year, which became 18 clear when his McLaren rival was disqualified from the British Grand Prix thanks to Ferrari's appeal being upheld. With the pressure building, Hunt won while Nicky was 8th in Mossport, putting the gap back to within a race victory's reach of the chasing driver.
The penultimate round took place at Watkins Glen, and it was James who took another pole position while Lauda qualified fifth. Then Jody Schechter led the opening portion of the race, before Hunt closed up and repassed him, also taking the fastest lap with seven to go. The Austrian was a distant third, meaning that going into the season finale, the gap between the two title protagonists was a mere three points. The event in question would be held for the first time in Grand Prix history in Japan at the Fuji Speedway, albeit not using the infamous Daiichi first corner where the bumpy banking was deemed to be too dangerous. Lotus's Mario Andretti took the pole, with Hunt second and Lauda third, but the Sunday brought with it heavy rain conditions. Protests similar to those held at the Nürburgring were done so here too, although the organisers forced their hand with much less disapproval than in Germany. The British home hero led after lap one, something that the TV audience in the UK weren't actually familiar with, as despite the interest from fans, because the BBC, famously stringent on issues such as sponsorship and regulations regarding what content children can see on screens, took great offence to the logos of condom company Durex being emblazoned on the Surtees cars. As someone born in 2004, I can't be sure that this is the case, but surely picture quality at that time can't have been that good for anyone who wasn't regularly fighting for wins or podiums, which the Surtees outfit definitely weren't doing, wouldn't have been on screen for that long during a race anyway. Regardless, as it was the zenith of arguably the biggest and most important sporting event of the year, the Beeb relented and aired the Grand Prix live despite the crude logos on show. As mentioned, Hunt led after the first lap, but his title rival Lauda decided that the start of his race would also mark the ending point for his championship fight, as he felt the weather conditions were too dangerous to risk anything happening to him, a completely understandable position considering what he'd undergone just a handful of months earlier. All James needed was fourth place to usurp Nicky's points total, and he fended off competition from the likes of Vittorio Brambia, who spun out challenging him on lap 22. Hunt's lead started to falter, then on the 62nd tour of the circuit with just 12 to go, he dropped a third behind Patrick Depailler and Andretti. With less than 10 laps remaining, one of James' tyres got a puncture, as he hadn't been cooling them off on the straights, and he thus had to pit, dropping him to fifth, needing one position to come back into contention for the title. Ahead of him was Depailler, who'd also suffered a blowout, Alan Jones driving in the controversial condom carriage, and Clay Regazzoni who was Lauda's teammate. The French driver soon swept into second, and Hunt followed him through, past the Australian and the Swiss, onto the final step of the podium, thus winning him the Drivers' Championship by one point. I've always said when discussing 1976 that this was a title Lauda should have never been expected to win, and that he won 100% of the time he had a season-winning car for the entire campaign. Regardless, Hunt wasn't at fault for Nicky's accident, at least not directly, as I don't know if the scenes depicted in the Rush movie where he swayed the room on voting to race at the Nordschleife, or the one where he apologised to his rival for tipping the favour in the way of racing on that day, were indeed true, as some bits of that film are fabricated or exaggerated Hollywood style. Again, whether you could argue that it was his fault is tenuous, but his driving throughout the season was immaculate. Apart from blips such as Monza where he spun out trying to carve his way through the field, there's hardly any mistakes you can point to. Given how badly Lando Norris has bottled his first shot at the championship, it makes me respect the likes of Hunt, Schechter and Keke Rosberg, more so the Brit and the Finn, for jumping into a title potential car and winning it the first time of asking. He may have had a helping hand from Nicky missing two races, and probably not being up to full power in Monza, but he did have to deal with the politics involved with constant disqualifications being flung his way. Hunt grabbed his golden chance by the horns and took it, something that several drivers before and since have proven is not an easy thing to do at all. James's laid-back yet incredibly passionate style endeared him to the fans and to the women of the time, and I think once he became a world champion, he had a similar feeling to Keke's son Nico that he didn't have anything to prove after winning the title. He took five pole positions and three wins with McLaren in 1977, but the car was nowhere near Ferrari's, and the year after it was even worse as he took just one podium in France. During this time frame, he infamously punched a marshal in a rush of adrenaline after colliding with his teammate Jochen Mass at Mossport, before realising what he'd done and profusely apologised for his actions. Another event that greatly affected James was the tragedy of Monza in 78, where his friend Ronnie Peterson died in an accident that he himself was involved in. The crash carried a lot of emotional weight for Hunt, who from there on in took a great disliking to the future veteran Ricardo Patrese, who he believed was at fault for the collision. 
1976 champion joined Walter Wolf Racing in 1979, but soon became demoralised due to his car's uncompetitive performance. And according to former Lotus team manager Peter War, during the Monaco Grand Prix weekend that year, Hunt told him that he discovered that if he lightly tapped the barriers of a tight circuit while giving the car a squirt of throttle in second gear, the drive shaft would fail. Four laps into the race, James retired with a broken drive shaft and promptly announced his retirement from Formula One. He had an incredibly short career for a champion, only lasting seven seasons, rivaling the likes of Farina and Ascari in the 50s, and Jim Clark and Jochen Rint, who, like the latter Italian, passed away before they could complete their journeys. After his early retirement aged just 31, he moved into broadcasting alongside the legendary Murray Walker for the BBC. Despite tensions early on in their relationship, the duo grew to be a fantastic accompaniment to the F1 circus, with Walker's unrivalled enthusiasm being complemented by Hunt's blunt and often comical analysis of what was going on. He tended to punch down on those who were clearly out of their depth, such as Philippe Alio and Hector Rabac, while criticising others like Andre de Cesares for their often wild on-track antics. I do league racing commentary, and to say I take inspiration from James's style and voice is an understatement. This looks like a driver who isn't really capable of doing anything, really. I think worse than me is the um, is the tier we're going to put him in. Right. Oh. Can I just say, whoever decided to race at Spain deserves to have their balls cut off because it's the most boring race I've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. And get Monaco on here. Get Monaco on the calendar, yeah. That's just... People say, people say oh, it's too hard. Well, if you're a fast driver, then, you, then all the fast drivers are good at Monaco. That's why I'm good at Monaco. He'll actually have an advantage over the guys. I mean, Jem Bullum has decided to fucking stay on hard for some twatty reason, but everyone, Enzo and so is well. Enzo. So the Haas boys are trying to cook up something. They're, 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 cook, they're, cook, they're, they're cooking up raw chicken. They're cooking up raw chicken <laughs> on that one. He decided to be a bit cautious at Tobon, which I think is the correct idea, because people are just going to be chaotic, especially at the back. It's like dumb, watching Dumb and Dumbo race each other with some of these guys. Remus and Enzo fighting, and more importantly, Damian and Toro fighting to make sure I miss it. Oh, yeah. See, look, Damian realizes what's going on and backs out into that turn. Some of us don't. Real life thing, and fair enough. But if it's just I can't be asked to race, then that's not really a good excuse, apart from maybe once or twice a season when you do have a shit time. So, yeah, Martin, institute that into the rules now. Otherwise, I'll send pedophile demons to your house. Anyway, right, we're going to move into the interviews pen and then we're going to ask some questions because that's what you fucking do in an interviews pen, you dimwit. Anyway, right, let's go. He wasn't just a grumpy old man, though. He would always praise drivers who had gone above and beyond, most notably Ayrton Senna in Monaco in 1984 and at Donington in 1993, just a few months before his untimely death. His incessant drinking and drug taking from his early career caught up to him even though he was trying to rectify his past misdemeanours, and he passed away aged 45 from a heart attack. He was a charming and charismatic one-of-a-kind personality who embodied the glitz and glamour of Formula 1 in his era. He was accompanied by attractive women everywhere he went and wore the badge of sex, drugs and rock and roll on his sleeve. He may have been a womanizer, but unlike many celebrities who went far more under the radar, especially prominent figures at the BBC, as far as I know, no one has posthumously accused him of anything untoward. Another thing most people don't know about Hunt, particularly those who post on Facebook about how everything was better in their day and that modern F1 is too woke, is that James was vehemently against apartheid in South Africa, and that during his broadcasting career, actively donated a lot of money to rebel groups searching for change in that region, without going public about his actions, and lobbied to have his commentaries blocked in the racist regime. Murray Walker once said that during the broadcast of a race at Kyle Army one year, I think by deduction it must be either 81 or 82, he went on a rant about how awful the South African regime was, and obviously none of that made it into the highlights package that the BBC put out in the days following the race, but this shows that Hunt had a strong moral basis. So to everyone who believes that modern Formula 1 is too quote-unquote woke, everyone's using that word now for some reason, and that all drivers should be old school like James Hunt, just remember that he was actually well ahead of his time, and by the standards of his era, ironically, he was probably on the more progressive side of the spectrum. Anyways, I don't want to discuss politics any further, so with that being said, I think that brings today's video to a close. I hope you enjoyed me detailing the completely cool and unique career of James Hunt, and if you did, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to see more content from me in the future.
You can also subscribe to my Patreon if you'd like to see exclusive content, get videos a day early, and have an opportunity to converse with me personally for as little as $1 per month. Big shout out to my already existing Patreon subscribers Andy Lamberts and George Stratford, and you can also follow my X slash Twitter account where I post boiling hot lava takes on F1, IndyCar, and NASCAR, and follow my Instagram for behind the scenes updates. With my shameless plugging over though, I'm Nedzo, and I'll see you all later. Bye!